Good evening. This is the Virginia Beach Public Library Art Exhibit and Meet the Artist event featuring Mike Lane. I'm Sandy Hopkins, Adult Services Librarian for the Virginia Beach Public Library. And I also have Rob Kennedy here. He is the Volunteer Art Gallery Coordinator. And he'll be introducing the artist. After the artist's presentation, Rob will engage in a question and answer session with Mike Lane, the artist. Welcome, Rob. Thanks very much, Sandy. And thanks to all for joining us. As Sandy mentioned, we are very pleased this evening to have artist Mike Lane with us. Mike is a native of the Virginia coast and North Carolina's Outer Banks, but lived and worked in Asia for almost 30 years. While in Southern China from 2008 through 2014, he studied with master artists to learn traditional brush painting or sumie. His artwork reflects Xia Yi and Guangbi Chinese painting styles. Xia Yi is a freestyle, simple, spontaneous, and spirited in presentation, and characterized by measured single strokes. The Guangbi style is more meticulous and has a layered texture. Elements of spirituality are also pivotal in Mike's painting. That is the concept of Imago Dei, the belief that human art creation is a natural reflection of the imprint of the creator God. Ideally, these notions are on display through subtleties in the brush line and in the creative design of nature, or what Dorothy Sayers called the mind of the maker. Mike's goal has been to apply these traditional Asian watercolor techniques to East Coast American landscapes, flora, and fauna. Often his work focuses on threshold spaces, such as shallow marsh, the eddies of a winding creek, a dunescape that transitions to the sea, or critical moments of seasonal change. These reflect degenerative truth regarding balance, complementarity, and the risk and joys of growth. Welcome, Mike. We are very pleased to have you with us, and we look forward to your presentation. Well, thank you, Rob. It's good to be here. Uh, I want to have spend some time with everyone sharing about the, uh, the art of Sumie. Um, another way of looking at it from uh, the Chinese point of view is, is a um, just ink that is brushed, uh, that comes for this style comes from the uh, calligraphic history of the Chinese people because they started with their the writing um, with their with the ink uh, using brushes. And so from there, it kind of just evolved and grew into um, the art that we see today, which we usually recognize as being Asian art. Uh, the reason I call this uh, presentation uh, Carolina uh, Sumie is because uh, after I spent time in, in Asia, I came back here and I had a goal of sort of wetting the uh, um, use of the brushed ink and to uh, my own roots, which are in along the coast of the Atlantic here. And I think that's really critical or crucial. Uh, otherwise, if I'm doing Asian art and I'm only painting pictures of, of bamboo and, and certain scenes that uh, are typical of Asia, I really have not really grounded myself. I wanted to ground myself in my own roots as a person who comes from this area. And so it's been fun to kind of see, okay, how can I take what I learned in Asia and those styles and see what they bring to uh, scenes that we have uh, just in, in, in Virginia, Eastern Virginia and Eastern Carolina and along the coast. Uh, just in this beginning slide, you can see the um, uh, pictures of crabs in the sea, and and all on the right hand side, yeah, another uh, a picture of uh, birds that are just uh, in that place of uh, enjoying uh, joyful harvest there as they uh, uh, kind of get their meal off of the corn that that remains on the stalks. Uh, one of the uh, critical things here, uh, as far as the spirituality of the, of the paintings, um, is just realizing that uh, the aesthetic that that an Asian person probably has already kind of uh, hardwired into their uh, thinking is uh, a little bit different from the Western 
um, frame of reference. Uh, one of the issues is, uh, or one of the um, things that, to consider is what they call negative space. And that is the fact that those shapes that we see in any painting, they are important, but just as important are the empty spaces that are outside, that are those lines also shape the remaining uh, neutral area. And that's that becomes a, a kind of a place of, um, of um, uh, inner thinking, or, or at least it calls us to kind of connect dots in a different way. Uh, and in fact, um, in Asian painting, it, it's the delight of the artist to allow for uh, unconnected dots. I guess that's the best way I can put it. Uh, a German uh, philosophy uh, called Gestalt theory sometimes uh, talks about how our brains, we just enjoy uh, connecting dots. And so that's where, um, uh, and we get pleasure from that. And so the, a painting that calls on us to do that uh, will bring us aesthetic pleasure. Uh, I'll just wanna move through some of the aspects of uh, the uh, different styles. Uh, as Rob said, uh, the CAE style, the, the free style is uh, spontaneous and spirited. It's uh, calligraphic. That is uh, many of the lines that you see in a painting like this one of these uh, these dried uh, wildflowers and field weeds um, in this one, um, it, it really comes from the, 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 the painting of, or the, the writing of the, of the uh, Asian people, the Chinese uh, calligraphy and the, uh, the Mandarin calligraphy. The, many, many times you can look at a painting and, you, and especially an Asian person can look at a painting and they can know immediately whether this is a Western person handling the brush or an Asian person. And don't ask me <laughs> what percentage they see when they look at mine. Probably they say, oh, that's a, a Western person you handling the brush. Because really, they begin handling the, uh, the, the uh, calligraphy brush, uh, the Malbi, at a very, very early age, maybe when they're in, in what we would consider to be uh, the first grade. Uh, five years old, six years old, and they start working on that. And it becomes kind of uh, a, a part of their thinking, the way that that brush behaves when you're writing the um, the uh, calligraphy um, characters. And so, um, but anyway, this is uh, also, they, they look at painting as being, um, part of it is the expressionistic um, side of it. And that is that the artist is in the moment expressing their mental, uh, condition, they're, uh, whether they're sad, happy, if they're exhilarated, whether they're sure, confident, or if they're, they're feeling some stress, you can see that in the, in the way they draw the lines. And, uh, and so there's a one breath, one brush um, mentality that is uh, not literally a one breath do they paint a whole picture, but sometimes it is very minimalistic. And uh, that there is an energy that comes with that. And also the, the fact that they're not sort of mulling over with this freestyle, which brush to use. They start with one brush and they kind of try to keep to one brush throughout the uh, entire painting. And um, it's kind of like a Zen moment. I guess that would be a good way to put it for many Asian people. There, it's a, there's a spirituality to that. There's a sense in which we're uh, in the moment, we're thinking about the, the natural scene and then uh, executing a painting with great energy. Um, Multi-loaded brush is also another um, aspect of Asian painting. That is, they'll take a brush and, and instead of thinking about putting one uh, color on that brush, uh, the, the artist will fill the brush with water. Then they'll take a, another co a color or maybe just a lighter ink uh, diluted with water and fill up one, maybe three quarters of that, the bristles. And then they'll take another uh, darker ink or maybe perhaps an, a color, and then they will dip that into the tip. And then that brush has three different uh, uh, colors in it or different shades or tones. And actually that's, and th here's another part of the sort of the existential moment, that, that water and that those inks are beginning to flow through those bristles. And so you, the, uh, the, uh, once the brush is loaded, there's only a certain amount of time you have to begin to execute the painting Otherwise, you lose that moment uh, for uh, that loaded brush. There's also something called flying white, uh, and that's uh, not so evident here. I'll point it out later on. That is, as the brush 
unloads its uh, its sort of payload or whatever it's it, the ink that's in it, it becomes drier and drier. And so m many times a Western painter might go back in and reload the brush, but the Asian painter says, no, it's time to slow down and allow more time for the remaining ink to come out of the brush. And then as the ink uh, becomes less and less, it then um, um, becomes a different instrument. Actually, it becomes a, a different part of the artist's um, uh, kind of creative uh, um, tool a box there. It becomes... And, and so that those dry uh, strokes have a lot of white in them. There, there, there's energy in them because there's um, that what they call flying white in in those final strokes, which are done with with a lot of patience, but also with a lot of energy. So that's uh, that's a little introduction to the uh, CAE um, uh, style of painting. Um, one of my um, kind of inspirations was a man named Chibai Shur. He, he lived from 1864 to 1957, but his his paintings are very, this is one of those he does, focuses, he focuses a lot on the what I call the little living things, um, uh, Xiaoxing Ling, and uh, he um, also, uh, you know, this is a painting that probably is what we would call a one breath painting. It's one that's done in the moment, and, is, and, and, and you can feel the exhilaration and the happiness of Qi Bai Shi in this one. Uh, here are some of the paintings that I've done um, in this in this simple um, one breath breath style. Uh, on the left, uh, the typical bamboo. Um, the bamboo is a uh, very very challenging, um, and it's and it's challenging from the standpoint that it seems simple, but it is not. Uh, they say that it takes the longest to perfect bamboo, and I'm far from <laughs> any kind of feeling of satisfaction in the way that I do my bamboo. But you'll you'll notice there that the bamboo has a a joint, and that joint is very important. Uh, it's called the jie, and the, that that point joint is it's solid at that place in the bamboo. And so that for that reason, uh, the uh, the uh, word for integrity in Mandarin uh, has that often has that word in it, jie, that word jie, and it means that inner strength that a person has. And so a lot of the different um, uh, parts of the um, Chinese painting have a, a traditional meaning. And so the bamboo is flexible, but it is one of the strongest uh, plants on the planet. They even make uh, scaffolding for multi-story buildings using uh, bamboo. So uh, the inscription's just uh, one that I, I felt high on and just excited about, just love never fails there, uh, a, a, an inscription there that comes from, uh, well, you, you find it in many places, um, but, uh, um, Amor Winket Omnia, or uh, Love Never Fails, or it comes from also from um, that that was Latin, but there's all it also comes from the Bible there. Love Never Fails, and uh, there's uh, one on the right is another bamboo with morning glory, uh, and so uh, and Chen Yu Hua, and uh, the, um, the, uh, the 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 morning glory is a uh, is also kind of has the same meaning in Asia. As of the rose, it's a it's a the, the the flower of love, and you can see a lot of flying white in that in that painting. The bamboo using that dry brush uh, has a lot of energy, according to the Asian way of thinking. Uh, we have um, a large painting here that I did uh, of grapes, and you'll notice also there are some uh, uh, wasps, and some yellow jackets flying around, and they do love. And, you know, if you look up in uh, in the biology books, they do love grapes. Uh, you'll see a lot of, of these uh, yellow jackets among them. Uh, my father is the, the the vine dresser. Is the inscription here? It simply comes from from um, uh, the um, I think it's the um, uh, let's see the the fifteenth chapter of John, and it's it has it refers to um, uh, God there, and and the but here this picture. Kind of tries to embody the um, uh, just the the vibrancy of a well tended vine, and you can see how it's been clipped, and there's energy there. And um, the um, in Asian ways of thinking, there is what they call the uh, the the host, which in this case it would be the vine, and then there are guests who who are who are, are arriving on the scene or who are inhabiting or allowed to inhabit the painting 
uh, around in, in the environment of that we consider to be the host. And so the in this case, the yellow jackets are the are the guests there in that picture. Here's another one called morning uh, meditation, some more uh, morning glories. And um, this is a, a mixture of, of uh, sh the uh, Xie'i style, the, 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 the sort of the freestyle. I especially like the way I get a chance to be free when I do the vine work. And you can see how there's a lot of a lot of freedom in the way those vines twirl around there. And then the, these kind of somber uh, meditative uh, morning glories. So that's uh, that one. Here's another one that, that um, uh, of the Atlantic coast using the freestyle. You can see the um, um, uh, the sea oats there. Um, and but what really what I used there for the stroke uh, was um, a type of stroke that is used often in Asian painting for orchids. But I decided to adapt that. And you can see the little crabs. You'll see crabs a lot in the lower right-hand corner in my paintings. And they, um, I call them the watchers. They are the one, they are these, <laughs> they're always there, um, silently present. And, uh, and there they are watching those two surfers as they move toward the um, Hatteras, um, the Buxton Lighthouse uh, Beach there that you can see in, in the distance. So this is a rather large uh, piece. And um, and so some of the pieces I do are uh, would would be more like uh, you would find in a um, a living room um, or whatever. It's this probably thirty inches wide and uh, twenty five inches high. Pretty large piece. Um, one that you put behind your sofa, I guess, is what you would say. Um, another one of the uh, influences in my uh, own work is uh, the work done by Song Yu Gui, and uh, his he lived from nineteen forty until. Uh, 2017, and I love his work because he captures the marshes using the Chinese, some Chinese styles, and also some abstract elements. And so um, I just have been inspired by him, and I wanted to show a picture by my by someone I consider to be one of my mentors. Uh, this is one of that uh, I did called Paths to the Sea, uh, another Paths to the Sea, but this is uh, a again, a fairly large piece, 60, it's five feet across. And uh, <laughs> I haven't framed this one. It's, um, but I, I, I like it. Uh, I liked it when I did it when I, because it kind of captures that mist, that morning mist uh, that's out there in the distance as we move toward uh, a foggy um, kind of a beach skate uh, down, out, you know, but you can't see it. It's kind of like there's a path that's um, leading there. And there are the two watchers there in the foreground. There's another two watchers uh, and uh, an ocean scene with the, the waves rolling in. Again, this is about 60 inches across. And um, the um, uh, this one is, I call it retirement. <laughs> Sometimes I, I can't help make a joke, but they're, you know, these two crabs there, they're, they're in their, their um, uh, happy place and uh, watching the, the waves roll in. So that's the, uh, uh, th that's a large piece that I did. And I do, I, I, I do like certain elements of this one because of the brush loading uh, on the crabs. Uh, you'll notice there that, that each those crabs were done with each of them one stroke. That, but even though I had some dark ink on the tip and lighter ink in, in per, you know, farther up on the, um, um, the brush. And so it, um, it turned out uh, I was in a satisfactory way for me. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, this, the marshes because uh, I do quite a bit of marsh uh, painting and um, I do some uh, thinking about it and I've done reading about it. You know, marshes are made up of, um, of you'll see the, the larger arrows there of a creek, and, uh, but there are grasses in the marsh and they form little eddies and where the, the water comes in and it, it slows down and then it, it curls around and then it goes, continues down the uh, the um, creek. And uh, I, I, I found that um, marshes are kind of like a metaphor or kind of a symbol for where we are and where, where I am, at least in my thinking about uh, my world. And so I, I'm always uh, tr trying to uh, um, cr find those places in the marsh. There's really huge design here um, where sometimes the um, 
uh, these eddies where the water slows down, that it allows for the growth of these this grass. And this cord grass is called cord grass. It's amazing. Uh, this is the grass that uh, the wetlands people are always trying to protect. And it, it's amazing because being on the coast, sometimes the water is more brackish and has less salt in it. Sometimes it has more salt in it uh, during when the ocean tides come in. But the way these this grass has been designed is that it is a you know you know yourself that actually salt water kills plants normally plants that live on the land but this grass that this cord grass is it has the ability to live on the edge on the border and to survive and thrive and what it does is it it senses what is the uh, degree of um, salinity uh, in the water outside and it and it adjusts its, its inner salinity just to be a uh, little slightly higher so that the water flows in and it doesn't flow out of the of the plant. And so it thrives and grows and it's really vital to our coastlands. And so there's an environmental side to, to my own heart as I think about our marshlands and, um, and just how important they are. Uh, and also just how a perfect picture of the fact that where there's, where there's a transition place, there is an abundance of of life, and they're highly dynamic places, and uh, and so there's uh, you, again metaphors for our own lives when we come to the edge of of things. Things seem to be a bit chaotic. We don't know what's going to happen. You know, like just like in the, the marshes where it floods or it you know it rains and the water goes the other way. That you know when we feel that way, that this is an opportunity for for uh, just growth. And uh, for change, and, and it's a dynamic place. I'll talk more about this in a minute. These places are called liminal spaces. I don't have enough time to talk about those in detail, but or transitional spaces. Uh, here's some pictures of trees that I've taken uh, pictures of in the, that are that create dynamic liminal space. They fall over, and then you can see that new plants begin to grow in the old uh, in the in the earth that that was that is held by those old roots of those uh, cypress trees. And so that's part of the uh, amazing uh, life on the on the edge. And artists in general, I guess I will say a word here that art in general, but also especially Asian art is expressionistic. That is, it's not photorealism that we're going for, obviously, in, in painting, but it's an expression of our inner being that is we're hoping to get out and to um, express out and make available to, for others to see, and um, and that's the um, that's that space that you know liminal the dynamic liminal spaces also show how you know there's uh, oh yes it's too bad a tree fell over but there's something invisible happening that is new places are are opening up for new plants to grow so that's a that's kind of part of the amazing wonder of nature that I try to capture. Here's a picture I call Fisherman Shack. It, it, it kind of captures a night scene and you can see how all of the, um, the, the trees are bent because of the prevailing winds as they, uh, they come across there. It's a lonely picture. And, uh, and again, for the artist, sometimes because the artist is so in, in, in touch with their inner life, sometimes it can be a bit lonely for the artist. And so uh, I think Asian painting is ideal for, you know, kind of expressing some of that, um, some of that um, loneliness and just the, um, the inner life. A few other pictures that are similar. I won't stay on these quite as long, but this is um, uh, the blue heron uh, flying off of a, away from a, a winter marsh. Uh, another one, I, this is um, one that um, kind of has a, quite a bit of messaging in it. Uh, it's called The Marsh Takes Back. And um, here, the, this liminal space, this transition space, you can see the old boat there in the lower left. It's, it's, it's broken down. It's, it's half flooded. It's been left behind. You can see some old, um, old foundations of a, of a pier there in, in the mid ground there of the painting, and then an old abandoned house there among the high cord grass um, there in the upper left-hand corner. And then um, you see the osprey up there carrying a fish. And uh, the, the, the marsh is, is always 
dynamic and the things of man, we are certainly present, we're enjoying, we're using, we're there, we're doing things. But then sometimes the water rises and it, it takes back what was taken. And, um, and so that's, uh, that's the message of this, of this uh, painting. Another one, many egrets. I love egrets, and uh, they are um, sort of uh, companions if you're kayaking around places um, uh, like in the Narrows of, uh, or in um, the um, First Landing Park, or if you're over in um, West Neck Creek or whatever, these birds are um, going to be your companions. Um, just love the, and you can see the the look the eddies the possibility of places where the eddies are and what's what's interesting is that uh the um the eddy is you know those grasses begin to grow up and you know where maybe a tree falls over like you can see in the foreground that tree has fallen over but it come, becomes a place where birds can perch and also those new grasses grow up and actually those are the nurseries for you know baby um, you know, the fish, uh, little fish and other things, and also the place where predators live, of course, and and and, and watch for a, a good a, a quick meal. But this is uh, this is the dynamic that that is the marsh. And so we kind of celebrates that. Uh, here's a, a kingfisher. Actually, there are, the kingfishers we have around here are not the, of the blue sort. I don't I don't think I've seen one, but we do have another uh, variety of kingfisher in our area here locally. And I'm hoping to capture more of, 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 you know, visuals of that kind of particular kingfisher, but you can see this blue one that comes from Asia. And you can see the, the there is that, that tree that has fallen over into the water and um, it becomes sort of a motif in, in my painting. This is a really a long painting. It's probably five feet wide, I should say wide. It's five feet wide. Uh, here's another painting with, um, heavy messaging. It's a, about a five feet wide painting. Um, it, it's uh, a painting that um, it's a view from the shallows. Uh, what I call uh, that is this water is, uh, you know, I kind of try to capture the shallow, um, kind of two foot deep, two feet deep uh, area of a little creek. And you can see there are, um, there's life there. There are these green tail um, shrimp. And uh, you can see the crab over there. But you also see the things of man. You can, if you look in the dead center, lower center, you can, you know, there are some rocks and some old shells, but you can also see the remains of a water bottle. <laughs> you probably didn't even notice it if I hadn't pointed it out. And then over to the left, you can see a Coca-Cola can. And uh, these things uh, go, go into the water. They become invisible to us, but they become part of the world of these animals. And they, they continue to live around them and in them. And um, and that's the victory of the marsh over over many of the things that have gone into it. But we we need to pay attention to it as well and and be good stewards of the marsh. This is another view from the shallows. Um, I tried to capture here some of the nobility of uh, animal life uh, in the shallows. Uh, the uh, couple of there are really two styles in. in um, evidence here. We have the, the freestyle, the shrimper, our, our freestyle painted in, uh, in freestyle and also the, the water plants. But some of the, that foreground, um, uh, very noble uh, looking um, uh, jellyfish, it, it, it gains its, 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 its uh, power, I think, from the fact that it's, uh, it's the one thing in the, in the painting, or that's that has a distinct, distinctly different style. It's a dossier style where I took some outlining and did some lively outlining. We'll look at some examples of that in a few minutes. But anyway, we're supposed to show these um, these creatures as they float through uh, and uh, actually have quite a uh, a story of their own as they uh, live life, in, uh, you know, on the on the edge. Here's another one, um, and uh, this one is about four feet in, in height. It's, uh, it fits on the scroll. Um, and, um, and so pretty much the same theme here um, for, as the other one. Uh, 
Uh, this is a, um, a painting that tries to capture mourning on the marsh. And, uh, and this was inspired by a, a, a trip I took uh, with my neighbor out to, um, um, yeah, I, thank you, Glenn, uh, who took me out here to go fishing one morning. And we, we just really saw some um, amazing um, morning mist and, and uh, animals and stuff like that. So I, it was, I was just inspired to paint this picture on the West Neck Creek um, out in the Pungo area. So and you can, again, you see the broken tree and it's, it's too it's sad that it broke, but it's, ha it's a happy thing because where that, those branches go down into the water, the, the water slows down, the silt settles to the bottom, grass grows up and new land is, um, is created really. And then on the other side, the right-hand side, we have an osprey um, there uh, on, the, on the limb of a, um, a tree that is, uh, has really lost its top, maybe because of lightning. This is a picture um, from one of my favorite places. I don't know if you've been to Pea Island before uh, at Oregon Inlet. There's the Oregon Inlet Bridge there. And um, and so um, I took a hike around, hike around there and took a lot of pictures. And um, and so um, I'm um, I call this P Island uh, trek. And there's uh, you can see the the footprints. Uh, interesting story about this. I learned a good lesson. Uh, I was finishing up this painting, and uh, I was trying to. Um, um, I forgot as I was, I got some water dripped on, on the painting and, and I thought, well, that's not no problem. The water will dry and it'll become invisible again. But what I didn't realize is there were some, some small particles of, of dried ink on the surface of the paper. And when that water hit that ink, it just, it just exploded. And, and I thought, oh no, what am I going to do? And then suddenly after some, well, not suddenly, but after some thought, uh, I realized I could make footprints in the sand uh, that would show how people either pay attention to the uh, area that's closed off for, for protecting the birds, or I could, you know, or that they go the other way. Uh, 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 you know, you can see there's there's a, a parting of the way. Some people pay attention to uh, conservation, others do not. And it's encouraging, more do not than do, um, but more, more, you know, follow the guidelines than, than don't. Uh, some just, uh, uh, there's the uh, the, the um, life the life uh, guard station there uh, in the upper left and in the bridge, famous Oregon Inlet Bridge in the Outer Banks. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. I also try to capture some of the buildings and areas near the marshes and. Uh, from this, these actually come from a place called Swan Quarter, which is uh, if you go to Ocracoke on the Outer Banks and then you take the, the ferry across to the mainland, North Carolina mainland, you'll you'll go you'll arrive in Swan Quarter. And um, I've had relatives. My mother was born there, um, but didn't live there long after she, um, you know, you know, graduated from high school. But I've, I've had relatives living there from time to time, and I'm just interested in the area. It's a it truly is a a fisher fishing village, and uh, a lot of shrimpers, crabbers, and those kinds of people. And I, I, I have a lot of friends there, and I love to go there. But I, I wanted to capture some pictures of, um, uh, and and some visuals of old buildings from there from long ago. And so on the left hand side, you have uh, Ken Mason's crab crab house, and that's my uncle. His his you can see his his trucks there, and uh, and then at the lower bottom, you can see the watchers. <laughs> <laughs> those crabs that are watching Uncle Ken's um, uh, place there. It's no longer there. It was washed away probably by a storm, and, and he has since passed away too. So, And then on the right-hand side is Barber Shanty, a place where people, uh, there's a history uh, behind this place. Um, all I can say is that when my mother was a, a, a young woman, uh, a teenager, people would go there to dance. And uh, they said that they put so many coins in the jukebox that it, uh, on Saturday night, they would run all night and into Sunday. <laughs> they enjoyed dancing there. So, and you can see the old uh, 
the old um, blue heron there, just kind of watching with wisdom as these um, uh, coastal dwellers, these human beings are trying to recreate in a very um, kind of slow moving rural fishing town. So that's, that's a barber shanty. Uh, I want to talk about another style now. Uh, we've talked about the Xie Yi freestyle. This is called the, the, um, the outline freestyle and it's called Da Xie Yi. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the freestyle and then you come back with an ink brush and you outline things with a lot of, with a lot of zest and free spirited uh, outlining. You don't really can kind of uh, meticulously do it, but you just outline. And so you can see here the blanket flowers of the outer banks. And then, um, and then the um, um, uh, body uh, lighthouse there, um, and uh, and then Route 12 is uh, that road that everyone who goes to the Outer Banks is familiar with that that road. And so, um, so the body island light is the name of this this painting. Very long, this painting's about five feet long, and it's in the home of one of my neighbors right now. <laughs> so. Um, but it, this this one has uh, actually three styles. I forgot to mention the little rabbit is in the Gongbi style there. Um, and so this is just sort of a conversation piece. I tried to include as many elements of my, it's kind of like a dreamscape, just adding in elements of my young years as I used to go there. You can also see these burrs. I don't know if you've seen these terrible burrs that get in your feet when you go to the Outer Banks. You can see them growing beside the uh, lovely blanket flowers there. And that's... Um, that's my dream of that area. Uh, this piece um, is called uh, Garden of Life. It actually, this, this painting um, won a small award at the Virginia Beach Art Center um, Award of Merit. And uh, it just sort of tries to capture the lyrical world of insects in this, um, this mum garden. And it, the inscription just is, uh, the little living things or the little souls is what the inscription says on this one. Kind of tries to zero in and just see the beauty and the little things that we have around us. Just amazing. The wonder of, um, of, of this, the design of things around us. It's just amazing. So that's, uh, that's this painting. And I think this one is in the home of someone in Richmond now. Here's um. The same inscription that love never fails and it's in the but you can see that clearly the reason i wanted to include this one is it shows clearly that that um that uh freestyle with outlining you can see how i did that with this um with these um blanket flowers and the uh, katie did and the little bird who's just sensing that uh, there is lunch over um, behind just behind it so that's just a fun painting Um, I do a lot of conversation pieces, uh, just things that I think, well, I, I want to talk about a painting or if I want a painting that some I can have that someone will look at and say, well, that's interesting. What did you mean by that? And so I have a couple here, that, several that I've, I, I just enjoy. And a lot of times they are the, 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 the freestyle with outlining, but not always. Uh, like on the left, this is a Christmas, um, some um, mistletoe. And you'll see that there's one berry left on the mistletoe. There's an old European um, tradition that says that um, the, the mistletoe has berries. And every time you get a kiss under the mistletoe, you, you pull one of the berries off. And so we're down here to this uh, old mistletoe. It, <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's two or three days after Christmas. And they're down. it's down to the last berry. So the last kiss is what this is called. And then on the right-hand side, um, there's these uh, crabs. You can see them here all gather around this hole. And uh, and so the the um, you can see it's called real estate. <laughs> so all you know we're we're having a uh, kind of an open house. All of these crabs are saying, "Well, this hole will be my new home or not." So um, that's the uh, one. Actually, uh, I've had some real estate agents who have purchased this one uh, and some copies of it. They they love it for their the walls of their office. This is called retirement malaise, and uh, it's just a. Uh, something that I just started one day. I started painting, and it just sort of evolved. You can see the peri. You can see the the the, the um, cattails, and then you have these little periwinkles that are all along as part of the marsh environment. And then you these paths that are just barely visible 
And then you have this major path and you can see the crab, um, the crab, the, these two crabs, their footprints, and they're walking out and they come out to this wide space and they're used to living in this um, world of, of, um, of uh, you know, cattails and then they come out and they're, they're just kind of overwhelmed. So a little bit of a retirement experience for many people. Uh, here's another um, Christmas uh, painting I'd, I've done before uh, in the, um, this is actually the Gongbi style. You have the typical uh, Christmas lights, but you'll notice there in the upper right-hand corner that the plug is unplugged, but they're still lit up. There's still energy and it comes from the other direction. And that is, you can see the manger scene there inside the bowl and called light of revelation. Um, Um, beach wash up or beach trash. I, I've done a number of these where uh, I'm, I am intrigued by the things that wash up at the beach. And you have shells, you have old flip flops, you have um, you know old sun sunglasses, uh, that kind of thing. And um, I just sometimes li like to remind myself of um, you know yes, it's a need for cleanup is there from time to time, but also there is um. It's just it's just the world I live in, and so I I find myself searching through the old. There's a, a hook there, and a and a, some old fishing line. It, so, it just shows our involvement, and uh, sometimes uh, the need for cleanup. Um, so uh, this is one that's uh, a sort of a little joke, uh, so to speak. It's called it's complicated. Um, you have the the sort of the uh, uh, sort of threatening uh, predators. So there's birds coming in quick on the, on, from, the, from the right. And then on the left, you've got these two crabs and they've just eyed these birds that are upon them. And guess what? There's, a, there's two crabs, but there's only one hole. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it's complicated. So um, that's a, sort of just some lighthearted uh, painting. Uh, then there's uh, the, the next style I'd like to talk about is the um, Gong B style. Uh, it's the it uses the double brush method, and what I mean by that is uh, the artist will will do an outline drawing, and then they'll they'll put in pencil they'll put that pencil drawing underneath the rice paper. Then they'll come in and do a very intricate line drawing of the whole scene, and then after that they'll take a, um, a, a very light green, perhaps or gray, and then they'll they'll fill in some spaces here, and they but. Then they'll take a darker gray and they'll go along the edge and they use two brushes at the same time. They'll put some ink in there and then they'll take a water brush and then they'll rub it out so that the ink sort of um, disappears into the um, uh, the other part of the leaf. You can see it. There's not a, you can see where it, the, that the um, the brushwork has been done on this, where the ink was put on and then some a water brush was used to sort of make that um, ink um, sort of fade into the, the, the color next door to it, next, next door. So, um, so that's the um, uh, a, a, um, uh, and then there's um, um, a, uh, a number of things I do with the, uh, the Gongbi style. There's um, uh, traditional things. These are uh, rather traditional pieces that I, I did earlier in my painting, um, bamboo. This is an interesting um, method. Uh, they take salt and put a salt on the uh, on this piece of bamboo, and then they they put some ink on top. And this the, the salt draws the ink in, and then you allow it to dry, and you brush away the salt, and it leaves this really interesting um, sort of um, modeled uh, look to the uh, the bamboo there. And these these are sparrows that are done in the in the tip traditional uh, uh, Gongbi style, where I drew a, a picture of all of this. And, I mean, I drew a, a line drawing in in, in, in pencil, then I put it underneath the, the paper, and then I traced the whole thing, and then I put in the color and did many layers. This is more like oil painting almost, in order to get this uh, this effect of intricate um, line work. And uh, and and also the gradations in color, so that this is called Gongbi, the intricate intricate style. The um, all of this, uh, especially this owl uh, display, the intricate style with the individual feathers being um, presented and the eyes 
um, and the beak just really, you know, done with a lot of attention to the small details of the um, of the uh, of the animal. Also, you notice up here. This is called this painting is called Insomnia because the <laughs> the owl can't sleep. There's these um, cicadas up here, and um, and the um, they are um, uh, just uh, making a lot of noise, <laughs> so they, he can't uh, he can't uh, he can't sleep. This painting um, of the mallard, uh, it's in the Gombe style. I, again, I, I did a pencil um, sketch, and then um, the mallard is in the Gombe style. I should correct myself. The mallard is in the Gombe style, but then I, I and I accomplished that painting a uh, part of the painting first and then i added in using the freestyle all of the uh, marsh uh, plants and i added them second into the painting and so uh in this painting i, I did it uh for a um a, it was i think it was a waterfowl association they have a an uh an annual auction or something to sort of a fundraiser down in the um, swan quarter area where uh, that where I love to go, and so I, I I think I donated this one, and I never heard whether it sold or not. We'll see. <laughs> Maybe sometime I'll, I'll I'll see it on the wall somewhere. Um, but uh, anyway, that's uh, that's the uh, mallard. Uh, I, then something happened um, about a year a year ago or so. Uh, I guess everyone has been influenced by the uh, this season of um, COVID and trying to figure out what it all means and being sort of having to stay inside or staying social distancing and everything. And, uh, and for me, it, it was, uh, there was just so much going on and yet I wasn't able to, to interact with people as much as I had. And so it, it had an interesting impact on my, on my um, painting. And what I started doing, I, I had a, I just decided I would just try and experiment some. I had more time in my studio. So I started doing something called pour, a pour, pouring. And where in this case, you take a, a piece of glass or plexiglass and you put the, uh, some ink and some different pigments, you pour them on the, on the glass and you might take a brush and swish them around a little bit, but you're not doing much with it in terms of um, trying to create um, realist, anything realistic. But you're just kind of working with the pigments and shapes a little bit, and then you take a piece of paper and you put the put, lay the paper down on top of that, and it makes what they call a mono print. This is a a print of of those pigments as they were flowing around. At that moment in time, they go into the, this thin uh, uh, paper. It, it it's very absorbent, and you it sits on there, and it makes a, a print. That's a one of a kind. You, there's no way that could be, you know, imitated probably or uh, or reproduced. It's a one a one time thing, and you can make more than one mono print off of the same pour. But each one is different because there's a different amount of moisture, and uh, and things have changed on the on the plate. And you're just making these pours. So I would have the floor of my studio would be covered with these huge pieces of paper, and uh, and then you just let them dry. And then you just let them sit around and you and, and you walk by them and try to figure out, well, what is that? What can, if I apply my brush to that, what do I see going on there? And um, it's kind of like C.S. Lewis and, and Tolkien. They talk about um, world making uh, or creation, you know, kind of create a creation making or making a world and um, like Tolkien does in Lord of the Rings. And so it's like, so it's like you're kind of, Try and you get some real ideas about how to, to develop it, and you kind of it just sort of flows out um, in a in a special way. So that's what that's what I did. I did quite a few of these um, over a period of about uh, ten months, and um, this is the first one that I did. And uh, the um, um, basically uh, an emerging blue kingdom there, and uh, you can if you can see that. Um, uh, and zero in a little bit, you can see there are trees and uh, waterfalls and it's sort of suspended there in this um, in this pour. And uh, seeing, and in some ways it became a, for me a metaphor for the COVID because COVID was so emergent. That is, we didn't understand it at the beginning and we just had to grow, experience and go through it. 
And as we were going through it, different things emerged. New things became clear. Other things became more uncertain, sort of like a pore. You never know what it's going to be until you get into it and start developing it. And so um, I just felt in, in a comfortable place as I was um, working through these pores. It kind of helped me process uh, my COVID experience. That's just that was just me. Uh, here is a couple more pores uh, that totally different. These are not landscapes. On the left, you, the, the, both of these are called uh, Hope Sp Hope Springs Up, <laughs> and uh, and so on the left you have an old stump that, uh, and you can see the the um, mushrooms there, the shelf mushrooms that are, and this decaying stump. And in the upper left there is a little pine sapling, done with Goldby style, in this uh, in this pour and this little pine sapling is growing out of the top of this old decaying stump and and so hope springs up right and then the same thing on the other side uh, some old pieces of logs look like they were burned almost and um, and then there is there are some uh, some uh, kind of uh, forest floor um, plants that are growing there um, uh, and um, the um, liver I think it's called liver um, or flowers. Um, I can't remember. I think that's what it's called. And, and so I put them in there and they're, they're part of the process of the, 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 the forest floor um, overcoming the maybe a forest fire or something. And you got some, you have some mushrooms there in the middle too. So hope springs up. And um, here's a couple of other ones that came, came out. Uh, one on the left was like, I looked at that one for a a long must have been weeks. At first, I thought it was a. I was going. I was walking on top of it. I was so disgusted with it. Um, but then I suddenly saw there was a fire, and uh, this is uh, this one's called the Devils in the Campfire, and I think um, for me this one um, it became a meditation on the fact that you know we've gone through COVID, but also there's huge um, currents of social change that are happening. I think everyone is is sort of um, if they're if they're paying attention at all, we're, we're just uh, beginning to assess, think through uh, the stories we tell and 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 the and and the way we talk about our lives and how we interpret them and everything. And uh, I realize that you know the campfire is a place where we find comfort, and we often sit around the campfire and tell stories. That's part of that's one of the amusements uh, that we as Westerners, uh, maybe other cultures do it too, but we tell stories around the campfire. And um, and so I, I realized that a lot of the assessing I was doing was in the typical narratives of my life and sort of uh, realizing that I need to go through and just think through all of those because sometimes um, they, they need to be um, adjusted to. I need to learn, grow at this time. And, it, and it's kind of, a, I, I don't, I didn't, it's, it was mostly for myself. It's not a didactic piece, it's, but it, but it can be interpreted that way. That is, it's a, it's a call for all of us to think through of our, about our narratives and think about, um, you know, about them and to assess them and evaluate them. So the devil's in the, in the, in the campfire. The one on the right is, uh, uh grace flows down and, um, and so you have this um, very amazing, um, uh, the long flow of of water. This this and starting from the, this distant waterfall, and it just keeps on going and going and going and falling and going down. So that's um, that's it comes from a faraway place. Sometimes the grace that we need, um, the power, the spiritual power, the encouragement, the hope, whatever, it comes from a faraway place. And uh, or it seems far away. It's not from in ourselves, but it comes from outside and comes to us. And so that's the uh, that's the messaging there. Uh, this one, um, this piece is called the last bridge before home. And if you look closely at this, this is a, a fairly large um, piece, 27 wide and 18 high. And uh, it uh, was a pour and I developed it um, and put in, if you look closely, you'll, you can count, I think there is one, two, at least three bridges in it. And then a lot of trails and things, if you go from the, the back to the front. And 
Um, you'll notice in the foreground, there's a little village and then there's this footbridge at the bottom. And that's the last bridge. And, and it kind of, it's a meditation of on those things that when we're, after a long trip, we're tired and we've been out trekking or whatever. And then we come, and so we know the, 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 the landmarks that indicate that we'll be home soon. And uh, so it's that feeling that this tries to capture. And uh, the um, uh, this piece, uh, uh, the last bridge is, is the inscription, um, uh, is, um, uh, for, you know, it, it, it did win a, um, the um, Sumie Store Award at the National uh, Sumie Exhibit. So, um, and um, so I was, I was encouraged by that, you, you know, a, a little, a little encouragements along the way and during the COVID time was, um, was fun. To, to have that in my life. Um, here's some close-ups of it. Uh, you can see it's done in the, the traditional style in part. We have, so we have a mixture of these pores that are almost semi-abstract. And then you have the brushwork that is like 2000, comes from a 2000 year old tradition of, of, um, of how we're going to present trees. And you can see on the left, the, the bamboo presentation. And then there are some decid deciduous trees presented in other ways, each of them with its own special uh, design on the kinds of leaf that, that is there. So that's um, <clears throat> it's a nice, it's, for me, it was a nice um, way to present my, my joining of two, two um, things. One is my Western experience of, with the, uh, the um, Sumier arts. Here are a couple of others that I did uh, a lot in that same period. I, I don't, there, there's not much more to say about these. They, they're about it. They're along the same vein as what I found in the others. Um, this one um, was um, huge. It's about six feet across or five, five feet across. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, it's a. Um, um, uh, you can see in the lower left-hand corner. You have the uh, the trees, like I mentioned before, and then there's a little s sidewalk, a little stairway going down, leading down into this um, into this uh, uh, distant um, kind of canyon. Um, there, I, this is called uh, the um, kayaking the divide. And if you go into for, look at some um, uh, close-ups of this, you can see the kayakers. Do you see the little kayaker there? <laughs> coming out of this. It's one of those crazy extreme kayakers who is willing to go over the little waterfall and to come down uh, out of this um, uh, canyon. So I have a kayaking friend, and so I was kind of thinking of him when um, when I was painting this. And here's another, uh, and a couple of other shots from the same uh, piece. And uh, you can see that the second kayaker is um, over there on the side, and the, you know, where, um, where the cursor is, and then here's that that that, that outlook place, and then this uh, the sidewalk that 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 welcomes us to go down into this this um, this canyon. So that's uh, an Asian thing. Oh, here's some more close. I did quite a few close ups of this one. There's there's that kayaker, <clears throat> that other kayaker, in the. So you can see this is got a different aesthetic. You can't you can stand way back and you can you can see some things, but you really have to look closely at these uh, pores to get the um the full impact of the ink. And the, you know, I did not this came from the pore. See these dotted I didn't put those on with my brush. They were just part of the pore. Really is really very cool to be able to work with a pore and to kind of build out from it. Uh this this painting is called uh um, praying for a change in the wind. And uh, this is, um, I looked at this and looked at this and I said, wow, that's a forest fire. That's one of those California wildfires. And um, and so I developed it along those lines and you have uh, a little uh, fishing village over here on the lower left. And, um, and the fire is kind of raging in here, you can see it. And I actually, I have a friend who does this wildfire um, uh, He's a firefighter in that for that kind of disaster. And he he wrote me on when I put this up on, I think it was Facebook. He said, you know, 
that's exactly how it looks at night. You, I mean, you, you, how it looks. You know, you can see the, the dark smoke, and then you see these glimmers of orange um, coming out through the through the, the dark smoke like that. So this is what he's. So that's how I de it developed um, as I was um, uh, putting it in. This is another kind of art that I did during the time of COVID. It's called uh, suminagashi. And in this particular kind of art, you um, you take some uh, take a pan of water that's about an inch deep, and you um, put a little bit of um, maybe some what they call photo flow or maybe some um, liquid de um, dish detergent in the water, and that increases the, the the surface pressure. And so that when you you put a drop or two of ink on top of it, and the ink doesn't sink into the water, it floats on top. You take a little toothpick and <coughs> spin it around. And it makes all kinds of crazy, um, crazy designs. And you can see them on the left there. Um, the dark is is the the, the sumanagashi design. And um, we used to use this same method. Um, Rob you're, and Sandy, you're probably uh, familiar with this. Um, the um, in old books, they used to to do the uh, the first paper. That's that when you open the, uh, the the cover of the book inside, there was a it was a design, a uh, kind of intricate, kind of a swirly design. Well, that was Suma Nagashi. And, uh, and so today we do it, we do different kinds of art with those pieces. And so I took this piece and I added a pine tree. And so I call this pine tree beside Dragon Rock. And because I saw some dragons in this rock, you can see this dragon face here, and there's a little bit of one right there. And so uh, that was my, uh, that was my uh, Suma Nagashi painting that I wanted to share. This is a very traditional pine tree, by the way. Um, little living things became a topic for me also, uh, along with some of the fours that I did. I wanted to include the amazing wonder of the, sm the small things of, of, the, of, of, of the natural world and how uh, wondrous they are. And so that's my inner feeling and tried to get that out. And to explain that, I put in a little, a lot of little honeybee, a little um, bumblebees, and things like that. Um, this is another one that I did, the little living things. With you have, um, it, it's a pity we can't really. Zero, I didn't do a, a close up here, but we have this, we have this uh, uh, crab here who's living in this hole on this marsh, a very lonely thing. But then we have two uh ladybugs up here on this, this little piece of uh swamp grass and so just a moment you know to think how these little living things go on around us um it just is very humbling and uh to me um, a spiritual messaging in in the painting very typical uh, this is a very typical uh one for asian painting it's got a lot of of interest in the negative space that um, you can see there's quite a bit of space where there's nothing here um, per se, but there's a tremendous amount of rhythm uh, that's created by this little piece of land here and then its connection with this this little mud flat here and then in the back. So we, we get some we get a little bit of a, uh, a, an encouragement aesthetically when we look at that. Um, I did a number of, of snow paintings and um, I think three or four, and uh, this one's called Designer Dusting, and uh, you can't really see it clearly, but I'll just point out that there are there's a mallard duck here, and two are dipping in. You, if, you, if I tell you what they are, you'll know they're they're ducking ducking their head into the water, eating, and then over here you wouldn't be able to see it unless you look closely. There, these are some. Um, uh, this is a duck blind, and uh, some hunters are in there, and there's a boat here, so that's um. A winter scene that I, I wanted to paint on the marsh after a, a slight snow, small snow. Another one that I did of snow um, uh, called "Good to Be Seen," and uh, you have this um, uh, snow falling, and it's uh, it's uh, out of season to see a grasshopper. But this old guy, he's been around and he's on his last leg, but he's kind of half frozen there. And this bird spies him, sees the uh the old fella and um you know so you know how we do in in my season if someone says uh good to see you and then you say good to be seen i.e well you know i'm alive so it's a good day 
<laughs> so this this grasshopper, you know, he's he, he's he's a little bit in peril, but it's he's alive, so it's a good day. And this is the the typical um, double loaded um, bamboo. You can see the all of this was done in one. This bamboo was done with one stroke with with darker ink on the um, on the uh, tip and then lighter grades of ink in the middle of the brush. Um, I, in preparation for a show, an exhibit uh, at the Virginia Beach Art Center, I did a number of uh, poppies and. Um, because poppies are a, it, I think the show was had it called people to, uh, to to paint things related to their belief and to their and it's things that and, that an inspiration, and so I don't know I just took the, a, a certain thread of that and, and decided to work on poppies. I had never painted a lot of poppies and I wanted to study it some, but I really found out that poppies are the probably the most international flower of remembrance. Uh, after World War I, they grew on the graves of uh, soldiers in, in the cemeteries of Europe. And there was a poem uh, about the poppies uh, as a remembrance of, of, you know, kind of like a, a, a Veterans Day or a Memorial Day, I should say, Memorial Day flower. And so I, I, we take inspiration from people who, who also sacrificed their lives for freedom and different things. And, and so that can be an inspiration to us. And so that's what this, this poppies um these poppies uh kind of accent this um this notion of uh, remembrance for those who've sacrificed their lives and i used a dry black uh ink uh for the um for the poppies usually you think of them as not having that but i use that in order to give them a stone like quality um that would um uh, be more in line with me with a more substantial weightiness uh, and um, as, a, as because they are memorials, um, um, solemn and inspirational memorials. So we've come to the, the uh, Q&A time. And uh, so uh, Rob, um, what, what kinds of questions do you have? Well, first of all, thanks very much, Mike. That was really a visual treat for us. And your artwork is so impressive, uh, just uh, beautiful oh, yeah. and uh, uh, just exquisite. And and also, we really appreciate your explanations. They're really fascinating and very, very helpful to us. Um, well, you're fine. Thank you. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, I love the way that you have applied these traditional Chinese styles to uh, the American East Coast. And I do have uh, what might be some comparative questions, I suppose. Uh, you mentioned several times very large scale. And I'm wondering, you also do a different scale? And is that, um, is there a traditional um, size they would use in China or does it vary? Yeah, it varies. I mean, yeah, that's, it seems to be at the discretion of the artist um, and depending on the subject matter. but. Um, there are, um, in terms of scale, uh, the landscape um, tradition in um, in Asia and in China um, has a usually host huge. Um, um, in, you know, we see them in hotels, you see them in museums, uh, landscapes that are uh, executed on multiple pieces of paper, and then they're glued together and put on frames that could be 30 feet across or something like that. So they're very large. Wow. And then and then and, and you have on the other end of the spectrum, people like my uh, the one fellow, Chi Bai Shur, that I mentioned, um, who uh, focuses on the little living things, the little souls. Um, sure. that, and, 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 and his work is so minimalistic. And, uh, he you know, his work is um, oftentimes really you know, can be framed in a very small frame. Okay. And as I recall, you do a uh, different uh, scale as well, different size. Yeah. I, you know, I'm actually, I, 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 I have felt at certain points in, in painting that I really like doing large ones, but I found that as I was involved here in this art community on the East coast here, that um, there people don't have a lot of wall real estate. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, you know, you, you, if you paint a big picture, you've got to really paint something that's worthy of, of that much of their wall. Um, they, 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 there's just because a lot of people already own a lot of art. And so if you're going to be one of the ones who's, that has the honor of being on their wall, it, it, you know, to have a big piece, it just takes a big commitment on the part of a person to uh, purchase it or to, to um, obtain it and use it. So I, I've gone from some of the huge, larger pieces to doing um, pieces that are probably a little bit more reasonable um, in, in size. Some of them, I guess the ones that I think that are the, about 20, uh, between 25 and 30 inches wide is, is what I'm, I'm doing more of those now. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That was going through my mind, I have to say, because I'm thinking, I love that. Then you say it's my feet. And I think, oh, no, I don't have any wall for it. But sure. they're really wonderful. And uh, seeing them in person, you had a show with us several years ago. Of course, they're even better. Um, now, some of your paintings have quite a bit of color and others not. Mm. And um, do you uh, stay with traditional colors that they use or have you expanded? Uh, the palette. Yeah, thank you uh, for asking. Yeah, it's uh, color is a big, big discussion uh, for the Sumi, for the the Chinese uh, brush painter who uh, is trying to be more traditional. They will probably select um, uh, a, and have a, a large portion of what they use in a painting. It will be uh, ink and diluted ink, uh, and then so we have. And and I've had teachers tell me, my teachers, they would say, oh, you can use gray for, you can use a diluted ink there. They'll know it's red. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> you know, um, and and so they just love ink. Um, the um, I think, though, the, the threads of tradition, uh, golden line uh, landscapes and, you know, Chinese painting, um, and, um, you know, has used something called in quite a bit. And... Uh, and uh, and some very um, kind of um, rich um, kind of um, blue uh, that and so those those colors and yeah some yellows but you're you're right that it's a it's really a limited palette uh, for most people who are trying to be traditional. If you don't have a limited palette, then they will um, they will um, usually uh, that to be um, a Western influence, which is fine. But just don't. But you know. But just recognize that it's not uh, from the tradition, the Chinese tradition to white colors. Like that one, that one painting that I did of the poppies that was kind of had the that was yes. the second one that had such strong oranges and yellows. Probably you wouldn't find that or in a traditional Chinese painting. It'd be more subtle and understated, the color. Sure. Well, it was certainly beautiful though, and uh, really captivating as well. Right. Um, and, and the brushes, um, are they um, similar or the same that you would use in Western style watercolor? Yeah, they're, I, I would say in some way, I guess it depends on the watercolorist. Um, for me, uh, as of my, I understand it, um, the, the brushes um, that uh, the Sumier artist uses are always round. They're never. They never have a flat um, edge on them, um, and uh, and so you would find, I think, probably a wider variety of brushes being used by um, the, the 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 Western watercolorists. Um, though some of them may correct me and say, no, I only use round ones too. But that's but that's that's one distinction. Another distinction is the. Um, you know the, the the four treasures of Chinese painting. You've got the ink uh, stick, which is you you grind it to get your ink, and you have the stone that you grind it on. You have your paper and you have your brushes. The brushes are kind of like an art, just to be able to discover which ones uh, you uh, are appropriate to you and which ones um, have the you know the right mix. You, usually, you know, there's you know various kinds of fur and um, that are, that's that's used and not. Synthetic brushes are not popular. They have, they usually have, should be. If you're if you're going to get a good brush, it will be have some kind of maybe it'll have um, what they call wolf hair. Um, if it's one that's someone something that's stiff or horse hair, and uh, and then they they'll use um, goat uh, for for a softer um, um, softer brushes if they want that. Um, there are other other kinds of fur that are sometimes you know used in with the with with their but they all. 
most artists know uh, they they find out what is in the brush and they are usually mixed mixed in such a way that it will hold the water well and also uh, will give them the amount of stiffness they need when they're trying to paint. Yeah. Okay. Well, very good. That was a helpful explanation. Um, and you did uh, you do sometimes use reference photos. Do you also um, sketch as um, or, or is that not uh, spontaneous enough, you know, on site or uh, do most of your work in the studio? How does that? Yeah, for me, for me, I, I've done a little bit of plain air painting um, uh, when I was in China. I, I, and I, that's funny. I didn't I had one and I could have shown that in this presentation, but for some reason I I didn't fit it in. But but yeah, I, I've done some plain air, especially when I go out to villages. Um, and uh, but I would say most is most of my work is done um, from either um, I'll take a lot of photos when I go out uh, and and actually, you know, going out in person and interacting in this. You just, you know, you, after a while, you just gain a lot of 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 insight to what as to what you want to do by being there. And then the photo kind of tips you off on or photos tip you off. I usually don't take one photo and take that as being I'm going to paint that photo. But usually I'll have maybe four or five um, ones that are all kind of from different angles. And, you know, what what is the the subject matter that I'm interested in? What was the air like? What was the what was the water looking like? And then I'll I'll kind of combine them. And so then the, the, the painting itself kind of is a is a summation of 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 that experience. And it's nice that you have a nice you have a cell phone now you can take you can take six or eight pictures just in in a, in a 30 seconds. And so it's it's really wonderful the technology that we have now to just be able to capture those moments and then bring them back to the studio. So I usually do that. OK, well, very good. Uh, and you're so good at explaining and discussing the artwork and the process. Uh, remind me whether you teach and also if you have any advice for someone who would like to get started in this art style. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm a, um, a member of the Blue Heron chapter of the Sumie Association, the, the National Association here in, in, in Tidewater. And so uh, I'm uh, relating to them all the time. We have we, one of the things during COVID, we, we started using Marco Polo, and they're a great group. Um, um, they, they all many of them joined into the Marco Polo. It's kind of like a it's a it's a social media that allows us to just post what we've been painting and then other. And you don't have to get, immediately answer the person, but you can watch it at your leisure and you make a comment or encourage them or whatever. We just. And I, so I, I, I'm benefited by that. I guess others learn from what I'm learning too in that context. I think probably at the beginning of COVID, I realized COVID was going to be serious when I lost my job. <laughs> I was I was I was working in uh, at the Visual Arts Center in, in Titustown in Norfolk as a, the Oriental art teacher there, and um, we just couldn't meet anymore. So we're all I have about you know maybe 25 people who are all we're all waiting for the that center to be able to open back up at some sure. point in the future. And then I will hope to be able to um, be the, I hope I can be that, be in that position again in the future to teach that class. And then thirdly, I, I, since COVID started, another virtual type of teaching that I thought I would do is called artistic vision mentoring. And what I do is, um, because my training is kind of in social psychology, I'm kind of lean toward this. And I've done a lot of what I call futuring with people. I, I kind of get with an artist and we examine, we kind of do an inventory of their personality. We look at the paintings of other artists that inspire them. We look at their paintings and the ones that they're pleased with and the ones that they think failed. And then they give me some pieces of failed art. And I I kind of online, I kind of take out my brush and we and I, I kind of say, okay, if I were going to take this to the next step, I would do this, this, and this, and they're watching me. And then at the end, they make a plan for the future. And so out of that process, we kind of get um, a feeling of, well, okay, new ideas about why I paint and kind of tapping into the motivations and the vision for my painting and maybe a plan for the future. So 
I've been doing that kind of, uh, um, I guess you'd call it mentoring for the past six, about the Sounds time. excellent. Um, and do you have any uh, shows coming up or future plans or goals for your artwork? Uh, well, um, I hope so. Um, I, there's a, um, a Gallery 21. Uh, I'll have a solo show there um, that will go up in, uh, in August and will run through the middle of September um down on down in norfolk at, um, on 21st street um and i'm really looking forward to that i mean it'll be my first uh, full solo show in person uh that will be um you know kind of a uh, a major kind of a, uh i guess invitation that i've received there in that way and um um and i think um um i'll be um Probably doing a, a show on this called the Seawall Art Show in Portsmouth. Be doing that one. Other than that, I'm still just waiting to see if I have other opportunities that come up. It's it's uh, it's hard to get back into the um, into the um, swing of things after we things have been kind of subdued. So, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm encouraged. I think it's going to. Maybe pick up in in twenty twenty one. I I still I have a number of pieces of art at galleries around the city here in Virginia Beach at the at the Beach Gallery on Laskin Road and and I have a lot of pieces down in a place called Edenton, North Carolina. I, have, I keep a a lot of paintings there at the Chowan Art Council Gallery. So, so sounds good. And uh, you'll have to remind me of your show in August. I definitely want to stop by. Oh, and thank I you. Encourage everyone else to uh, stop by and contact Mike uh, to for possible purchase wow. or teaching or mentoring. Uh, again, we thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we loved having you with us, and uh, we thank all of you also for viewing. And we encourage you to watch us again next month when encaustic artist Sandra Alderman will be joining us. Our show is called The Whole Ball of Wax, and it should be great, too. Thanks again. You're, you're welcome. Thank you.